Welcome back. Uh, we've got a great uh, lineup here with to finish out uh, most of the day with Brent Porcio of Top Velocity, one of the uh, top pitching developers in the nation. Um, he's got some really great stuff to talk to you guys about, so uh, here he is. Guys, if y'all want to come in, if y'all are too far away, y'all can move up. Come on, fellas. Yeah. All right. All right, I'm curious. Anyone out there heard of Top Velocity? All right, cover. All right, so came out of my career, tore my rotator cuff at 18 years old. So it. You know, the big threat of being a young kid and coming up in the game is injured, right? So I went through it. I always say uh, I, was, I was probably one of the worst. I've Even the guys I've worked with was one of the worst injuries that I've worked with. I've actually just recently worked with someone who worked. But I tore my road to the cup, and my road back was figuring out how all this stuff worked, right? Figuring out how your bo the biomechanics, the physical health of your body and your career uh, is important to how long you play this career. Or how long do you play baseball? How many guys here want to play this game until they're 30 years old? Raise your hand. 30 years old? That's pretty good. 40 years old? Oh, you guys are playing 40 years old. I like that. All right. Well, that's the thing. It's like I look at pitchers and I look at, yeah, how can I increase their performance because we're top velocity. At the same time, too, I'm always thinking, how can I keep them healthy? Because to me, that's a big factor in this. I believe if you can't put them together, you can't put performance enhancement and injury, uh, you know, your injury potential or reducing or preventing injury together. I don't see why that's beneficial, you know, but I, I feel like there's a lot of programs out there today that uh, that do that. It's kind of like two different things to them. They're either going to teach you how to throw really hard or we'll go over here and teach you how to get healthy. And they're different. I see them as one thing. So when I set out to do top velocity, I wanted to, to be evidence-based. I wanted to get as much research and information on it as I could find so I wasn't just spewing out conventional wisdom or which is kind of like some of the old school uh, theories that we hear. I wanted to put out some new things that are based off of data, studies, people that are even smarter than me, right? And I could collect that and come up with the real understanding of how all this works. So that's when I say evidence-based. It's based on research. It's based on science. It's based on studies that say, hey, when we took a group of pitchers, the healthier ones were doing this. When we took a group of pitchers, the, the ones that performed at a higher velocity were doing this, as opposed to what we were all just seeing, seeing or what we thought we were seeing. That's what it means to be out of space. So, what do you guys think? Do you think that's a good approach? Using science as opposed to what just you were told when you were young or what someone else told you? I think it's a good approach. It's becoming more popular today. So building healthy arms. So building healthy, high velocity throwing athletes has been my focus. So uh, it's an institute I quote a lot. Has anybody ever heard of the American Sports Medicine Institute? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. American Sports Medicine Institute. Okay. Dr. James Andrews, some guys heard of it. Dr. James Andrews and Dr. Glenn Fleischick formed it. And they do a lot of the research behind athletes as far as injury and performance. They really study them and look at what's going on. They also operate on a lot of them. So a lot of the great athletes have been operated on outside or within the ASMI Institute. When they looked at injury, right, and they took a study of, of all these patients or players that were injured, they found that there were three things causing the injury. Four are uh, overuse, Poor mechanics, poor physical fitness. Does that make sense to everybody? What's overuse? Throwing too much. Throwing too much. Perfect. With poor mechanics. Right, how you move, how you create the movement and the skill. That's perfect. How about poor physical conditioning? Yeah. Strength, right? Mobility. 
endurance and shape, being, being able to endure the training or the, the skill or the game. Perfect. So those three things are what's leading to injury, overuse, or mechanics, or physical fitness. So here's a study that looked at the overuse aspect. So we're going to go through each one, and we're going to look at how are they contributing to the injury. Um, so oh, basically overuse. This study here said those who pitched fatigued were 36 times more likely to have an injury. What does it mean to pitch fatigue? What? Growing tired, right? You're physically tired. Raise your hand if you've ever pitched tired. Good, a lot of, a lot of people. So it, it does happen, right? All right, this one said if you pitched more than eight months out of the year, you were five times more likely to have an injury. Okay? Who's ever pitched? Anyone here has ever pitched more than eight months out of the year? You might not want to admit. Eight, eight months is a long time. Anyone? Okay, some of y'all have. It's getting more common. Why is it getting more common for people to be pitching eight months out of the year, even at a young age? Why is it getting more common? What? Right. Perfect. Basically, there's more opportunity to play more year round, right? That's a great thing, but at the same time, too, don't you think we need to be careful about you know these opportunities? Okay, so that's something you need, you need to be aware of. See, things like greater than 80 pitches, three times, almost four times more likely. Fastball is greater than 85 miles per hour, almost three times more likely. Pitch more than 100 innings in a season, or this one year, 3.5 times more likely. So they're just showing you, basically, the more you throw, the more prone you are to injury. Okay, so we have to be very careful about overuse. So we're going to talk about some of the things that can help us handle the overuse issue. And that's going to be uh, what's called acute to chronic workload ratio. You don't really need to hear those big words. I'm just going to tell you how it works. And there's a great device that helps with this. Anyone's ever heard of the Modus sleeve? So it's a sleeve. It's a Bluetooth device similar to what uh, I'll talk about with 40 Motion is here. And they just look at when they have you throw every day for at least two weeks, they look at how consistently were you throwing pitches or were you throwing the ball. And what they say is if you jump more than uh, basically 130% of your average ratio, you're putting yourself at risk. So it's, it's something very important to be aware of. And I call it basically stress management. So if I'm going to throw every other day 30 pitches, okay, and all of a sudden I want to get up to, say, 80 pitches in two weeks, would it be smart to go 30 pitch, 30 pitches, 30 pitches, 30 pitches, 30 pitches, and then that one day go 80? Would that be smart? Okay. Or would it be smarter to go 30, 35, 40, 45, all the way up to 80? What would be the smarter way to go? That the second one, right? Slowly build your way up. But also be careful too, there's another way we could do this wrong. What if I went, instead of, I was going 30 pitches every other day, all of a sudden I stopped throwing for a week, and then I came back and threw 60 pitches. Would that be smart? Right, because your ratio, when you go down and you take all that time to rest, now it's going down to no pitches. So if I jumped in and threw 60, I went well over that 1.3 ratio, right? So you gotta pay attention to that. You guys, you gotta look at how much am I throwing consistently on average, and then I, can't, I don't wanna make too much of a jump. I would say something more than 30% of what you've been doing over time puts you at high risk. So that's gonna help you deal with the overuse issue. Half the mechanics, basically bad mechanics is what it's saying. Bad mechanics are going to go into the injury issue of poor mechanics from ASMI. Curious, does anybody have any ideas of what bad mechanics are? What? Very good. That's a good way of looking at bad mechanics. Anybody else? That's perfect right there. So some things that good mechanics, and there's actually two that do something very important. Pretty much a lot of the mechanical improvements increase performance, but there's two that allow you to increase performance and reduce stress to the arm, which this would be amazing, right? So I can actually throw harder, but it's not going to put more stress on my arm. 
why do I say arm first of all? Why do I keep saying stress on my arm? Why not stress on my leg? Why do I say stress on my arm? Okay, but we use our legs too. We use our legs too, but more specifically, why do I say the arm? Because, okay. Yeah, so typically that's the one we injure the most, right? We have a pattern of injury in baseball. That means it's pretty consistent in baseball that people injure their shoulders and elbows. So when I say the arm, I'm talking about the fact that that's something that we consistently injure in this sport, right? So there's two biomechanics that said, hey, we can increase performance and we can reduce stress to the arm, the joints that we typically injure. And the two were, or four, or let's first talk about the uh, separation. We're gonna kind of come up the body. So the first one was more hip to shoulder separation. That's when your hips are opening, your shoulders are staying closed or delaying. So the more you could separate those, your hips and shoulders, studies showed that your velocity had the potential to go higher, but your arm stress was able to come down in the process. That's a huge deal with baseball, right? Because once again, we have a pattern of injury and we're trying to avoid the, the reasons for injury and mechanics being one of them. So that's one of those mechanical components where we can, we don't have to lose velocity to save our arms. We can actually keep increasing our performance and not having to worry about our arms. So that's really important. You guys should remember that. Another one is forward trunk tilts. The more we can push our trunk forward before we release the pitch, did the exact same thing. It allowed our velocity to go up and the stress on the arm to come down. Why do you think, I think that one is a simple one to understand why that's happening. Why do you think as your trunk goes more forward before you release the pitch, that the stress on your arm is going down, but you're still able to throw harder with that movement? Anyone have an idea of why that would do that? That's a tough one. Be thinking about it. So basically what's happening is, think of the whip. Coach Linsky just did the whip for you guys. There it is right here. Think of the whip, right? If I take this whip, I'm trying to get the speed to the end, right? Would it be smart to go down here and grab the end and then just throw that? That's the smarter way to do it. Start at the bottom and start moving the energy from there and let it work its way up, right? So what do you think is happening when you're allowing the trunk to go forward before the end comes around or the end comes around? Same thing, right? You're letting more energy come up, which will accelerate more energy at the end. But at the same time, too, because of that, more energy is going to the end. The end doesn't have to do all the work, right? Because the energy is coming up. It's being delivered to the end and not having to be created at the end. So that makes sense? So you're starting to get an understanding of how biomechanics work best, how your mechanics work best. The more energy I can get to come up, the less stress I have to use or create at the end to create the velocity. Right, so is that linear movement or full flexion? Or both? In that study? Was the, yeah, the second part, the trunk, yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's the flexion of the trunk, okay. but also more than likely relating to the fact that there's more linear energy yeah. in the trunk. Right, so that, that's a good point. Um, as far as looking at the physical abilities, right? Poor physical fitness is another aspect to this. This said weakness and inflexibility uh, that led to injury. So typically pitchers that came in that had weak shoulders, so they measured their shoulder strength or their upper body strength, they were more susceptible to injury during the year. Does that make sense, right? So if you go into your season, you're starting your season, you have really weak upper body, you have a really weak upper body compared to the, your, one of your peers or one of your other teammates, there's a better chance you could be more injured on the average, right? But a lot of people stop there. A lot of baseball thinks, well, well that's that's only a place we look for weakness in the system is the upper body. But no, this study said weakness and inflexibility in the hips was shown to put more stress on the upper body. So it's not just because my arm takes all the stress. My arm just doesn't have to be strong. I also have to have strong hips and legs because that's what generates the energy 
that allows the upper body to have, not have to create it. So if we can create more energy through more physical fitness in the lower half, that's also going to make us less susceptible to injury. So when you think of things that need to be strong, let's not just think of the arm, because like the whip, we use the whole unit to create the energy, right? So when we go into understanding the, the mechanics and how the mechanics lead to the injury, and ultimately we're gonna show how the mechanics lead to improved performance, we need to understand the kinetic chain. Has anybody ever heard that term, kinetic chain? Anybody want to give a shot at what it means? So it's a tough term. All it, all it means is a connection of segments, right? It's a linked connection of segments together. Like an easy way to, to think about it is, of course, the whip, but our bodies are a little bit more rigid than the whip. So I like thinking of like nunchucks that were all connected to each other, a bunch of nunchucks connected to each other. That would be a better way of understanding the kinetic chain of the human body. You do the bones, right? You have these rigid bones in your body that are connected. How important is the kinetic chain to the pitching delivery? Or to this whole equation of how do we throw harder but not put more stress on our arm? How does the kinetic chain affect that? It's critical. It's probably one of my favorite studies. It's a study you should memorize you should tell every coach because it'll blow them away. It said, Wheeler Chandler calculated that a 20% decrease in kinetic energy delivered from the hip and trunk to the arm requires a 34% increase in the rotational velocity of the shoulder. This did impart the same amount of force to the hand. So I'm going to simplify that. It said a 20% decrease of energy that you are driving up through your hip and trunk to your arm. And if you decrease that by 20%, you don't, it's not just add 20% as you rotate your shoulder or internally rotate your arm. So you got to add 34% to put the same amount of force to the hand. So that's the problem with what's going on when you go to the whip and the whip understanding. If I drop the energy down here in the legs by 20%, you almost have to double that in your arm to put the same force on the ball. So what, what's the first thing that pops in your mind when you hear that? What are you gonna have to do when you lose that 20% of energy, energy in your mechanics? What do you think you're gonna have to do? You have to pull on that arm, you're gonna have to crank on that arm to try to make up for that energy. And then the first thing you think of is, wow, that's gonna hurt. Was anybody thinking of that? Once I start cranking on that arm, were you thinking, man, arms, you know, start hurting, get tired, you know, we're going to start having problems, right? And ultimately that's what's happening. That overcompensation of energy in the upper body is forcing you uh, to put more stress on your arm, right? So we don't want that, right? That's not a good thing. This 20% decrease forcing us to crank up almost twice the energy to a 34% increase. That's not a good thing. Wouldn't we like that the other way around? Wouldn't it be great if I could push 34% of the system? And my arm could cut back and shut off 20% and throw the same amount of speed? That would be great. But don't you think the equation would work that way if we flipped it around? Instead of shutting off 20, bringing up 34, now the arm can pull back and we can keep our velocity up. And that's typically what happens. And it's a great way to understand that. The arm needs to be perceived not as a generator. It needs to be perceived as a regulator. Does anybody know what the difference between a generator and a regulator is? So a regulator would be just adding the energy when it needs it, right? A generator is, man, this is all we got. I got to create all the energy. The regulator goes, hey, there's energy coming up. I just, I need a little bit more right now. I'm just going to add a little bit more. Isn't that a better position to put the throwing arm in when you're pitching or throwing a baseball? Because think about that. Is, does the arm have other roles besides just creating or helping create force to the ball? Does it have any other roles when you throw a ball? Any ideas? What other roles does it have? Yeah, it helps with the spin. What else? What other roles does it have? From the shoulder up, it kind of helps guide the pitch to the location. If you're throwing in the location or if you're throwing across the field, it's going to help it guide it to the target. 
So think about it, if the arm has more roles than just generating energy, if all it's trying to do is generate energy, or all its efforts is to generate the energy, how well is it going to do performing the other roles? It's, it's going to be harder for it to perform the other roles as well. So when, you're a, when you bring more energy up and it can back off in the energy generation, now it can take on the other roles and have more effect and you'll be more effective in the ultimate day end result, right? So, this kinetic chain thing, right? This is what we need to learn. We need to learn how do we get this more energy up so we're not caught in this overcompensation problem, right? How can we use the body better so the arm's not forced to be a more of a generator than a regular? This study said, if you improperly sequence your body, it's going to put more joint forces on your upper body, kind of going along with what we learned from Kibler and Chandler. That if we don't use the body in a perfect sequence, that's what's creating all the stress coming up in the chain. How do we use it in a proper sequence? What is a proper sequence? Before I go into it, I'm interested to see. Does anyone know what a proper sequence, how to move the body when you throw? Anyone would know what that proper sequence is? I'm glad I'm teaching you, right? So the proper sequence would be, and going back to Kibler and Chandler, we don't want to lose the energy down here because then we got to force to overcompensate. So the proper sequence would be, hey, let's do a really good job of getting energy down here by driving the hips or driving the legs forward first, right? So that's a, a sequence is, is an order of timing, right? So let's get the hips and legs to go first. Then what's going to go after that? Let's go back to the whip. I like to look at the whip this if I compare it to the pitching delivery. This is the hips right here, right? This is the hips. The arm moving the whip is the legs, right? The body of the whip is the trunk. Then the end of the whip of the arm. So the proper sequence, right? We're going to move the handle, which is the hips. We're going to drive the handle. What's going to go next? What goes after the handle of the whip? Yeah, we're the, bot, the meat of the whip, the body of the whip. So that's going to go next, right? Then what's going to go after that? Then the arm. Okay, so that's the proper sequence. And just simply think about it is just go to the whip, right? That's why Coach Zelensky brought it out for you guys. Just go to the whip. You don't, you don't have to sit here and think hip rotation, trunk rotation, internal rotation. You just think handle, which is the hips, body, in. That's the sequence. So every time you throw a ball, you should be emulating that. You should be emulating that in your pitching delivery or your throwing delivery. Just like I said, the legs are the arms, the hips are the hands. Drive the hip. And just like when you're the hips driving, you want everything back, just like with the whip, because it needs to be out of position to then, when, so its timing comes in, and then the trunk, and then the arm, okay? So remember that every time you throw, try to emulate the sequence of the whip, or what we call our proper sequence. So improper sequencing is going to be the opposite, typically, or it's just going to be out of whack. You know, like we kind of we learned from the original study with the 20% decrease. I might start going with the trunk really early and leaving the hips behind, right? So my hips don't really get through it ahead of the trunk. Halfway through the hips ready to go, the trunk starts first, the hips kind of come second, and then the arm pushes through. That would be an improper sequence, which, remember the study showed, led to more joint forces, which typically are more joint torques, which typically lead to injury. So we need to learn how to properly sequence our bodies and bring the energy up, right? And also understand, torque, Arm torque, does anyone know what torque is? Good, more in a rotational fashion. fashion. So it's basically rotational um, forces is what it is, rotational forces. So the more, this study said, the more rotational forces in your shoulder and elbow typically led to more injury, right? That kind of goes back to what we learned about the kinetic chain. We need to try to bring those forces down while still bringing energy up so we don't lose velocity. So that's the point I'm trying to make. You can play in this game 
healthy and play at a high level for a long period of time if you learn not to over obsess about arm torque. And what else is another way? What, what other way of defining energy will lead to more torque? What's another word that we typically hear in the game of baseball? Not arm torque, but arm speed. Arm speed. Anybody ever heard that term? Arm speed? So arm speed is the same thing. More arm speed potentially can mean more arm torque. So these old school mentalities of you got to get your arms faster, stronger, you have to be careful because you can be ultimately focusing on generating more arm torque and not focusing on sequencing the kinetic chain and driving up more energy so your arm doesn't have to handle too much of that torque and stress. And it's interesting. And, and, I, and once again, like I said, you don't get a lot of this information because not a lot of the information that's out there that coaches use comes from science. A lot of it's come from how we've always taught this game. We understand if you look at studies like this, it starts to expose how this is really happening. That a lot of what we've been learning might not be the best way. This study looked at the difference between youth, high school, college, and professional pitchers when it comes to arm tour. So they wanted to see how much, which level was putting more stress on their arms um, in, in different ways, in overall stress or in based on body weight. So overall stress is just who, who's putting more newtons of, of stress on their body and based on body weight is saying, okay, if we normalize it, we make everybody the same body weight, then who's putting more stress? And when they did that, it got very interesting because we know who's bigger, professional pitchers or youth pitchers? Right, professional pitchers. So when we make them all the same size by kind of manipulating the, the numbers, then we see, okay, based if everyone's the same size, who's putting more stress on the arm? In this case, if you look right here, professional pitchers are putting low, less internal rotation torques on their arm than youth pitchers. Right? And youth pitchers. Youth pitchers were the second most sports, then college pitchers, then high school pitchers based on body So how is that possible? How is it possible that professional pitchers, when everyone's at the same body weight, are actually putting less torques on their arm than youth pitchers? How is that possible? Yeah, that's, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> Going back to the overuse issue, right? but outside of the overuse issue, which is a great point, why are pro pitchers putting less torques on their arm than youth pitchers? The youth pitchers, right? They don't have proper time, right? What else? What do you think? Right, and that gave them an opportunity to learn how to do the movements better or to make their bodies more physically fit to perform the movements. Or Darwinism, survival of the fitness, fit the fittest. Everybody heard anybody ever heard of that? Which means the ones who didn't make it to pro level more than likely got hurt. Do you think that's possible? Yes. Right? So it's telling you right there, raise your hand if you want to be a professional pitcher again. <laughs> Who wants to be a professional? How just professional ball player, right? It should be everybody in here. What do you think the best way to do it? To do that is based on this evidence. I want to hear someone put it together. What's the best way to get to the professional level from where you are today, based on this evidence? To be able to increase your performance while keeping your stress as low as possible, right? Reducing stress while you're increasing performance. But if you think that's easy, guys, you think that's easy to do? It's very, very difficult to do. And it does take coaches. It does take programming to do that. It takes tools. It takes understanding. It takes uh, methodology to do that because it really isn't that is easy. And unfortunately, I think the survival of the fittest understanding is the ones that aren't getting hurt were genetically more capable of putting less stress on their body at a higher performance level. What does that mean when I say genetically capable? 
What are, what are genetics? What? Say it louder. Your genes. Basically, your DNA, what you're made of, right? Yeah, what you get from your parents. Right. So, whatever you were given, right? And not that, it's a blessing what we're given, but sometimes some of us have more capabilities with their genes than others. Does that mean they're always going to, or does that mean they're going to be better than you? No, because it's not everything. There's more to it than that, but it does give them a lot of help and support along the way. You can still overcome that, but once again, that's where it gets challenging. It takes methodology. It takes you know, tools. It takes uh, effort, work effort. It's also interesting here on the same lines, once again, the data is exciting because it's showing us really what is happening. We're not listening to what just people are telling us. It's showing us what's really happening. In this study, it was a similar effect. They looked at youth, high school, college, and professional pictures. And we looked at right here, we're looking at intra-rotation velocity. So the velocity of the shoulder, the same force or the energy that we had to create in the study that said if we lose 20% down here, we have to create 34% of that intra-rotation velocity. We're looking at that right here, and we're also down here looking at ball speed. And at the youth level, the internal rotation velocity of the shoulder was about 6,900 degrees per second. And the ball speed was, I have his meters per second, but it was probably somewhere around, I don't know, 60 or 70. You'd have to convert it. And then when we go from youth to high school, the internal rotation velocity, sorry to see. The internal rotation velocity went down from youth to high school, while the ball velocity went up. So after all this education I gave you, why did that happen? You can raise your hand, why did that happen? Why did the internal rotation velocity from youth baseball to high school baseball, the internal rotation velocity, why did it go down but the ball speed went up? Anybody know? Right, they, they didn't lose that 20%, right? They, in, in high school, they learned to create more lower half energy and bring it up. Now, so their arms didn't have to work as aggressively, right? Very good. But look, it does go that way. High school to college, interrotation velocities went 6,800 degrees per second to 7,400 degrees per second. That's a big jump. And the, and the velocity went up. So there, they just cranked everything up, right? If you go through it, everything cranked up. But here we go. Once again, it gets interesting again. College to professional, 7,400 interrogation velocities. The professional level, it's 7,200. And ball speed went up. So once again, a big evolution of more than likely the biomechanics, the, the better use of the kinetic chain, right? Or also, too, to, be un to understand that the physical abilities that you have or develop can help you better sequence the kinetic chain to get the better result. So you gotta look at it that way. You gotta look at it two ways here. When you are creating movement and energy, you can create two energies to the ball. You can create kinetic energy, that's the energy coming up the kinetic chain, and you can create what we'll just call arm strength. My arms back, I'm gonna pull it forward, right? That's where the arm's more of a generator. And actually this video, if I can play it, shows a guy who actually separates the two, which is a rarity. I rarely see this happen. This is a great example to show you the difference between arm energy, brain truncation energy, and kinetic energy, energy coming up the body. Ideally, we want them to time and release together to optimize ball speed while reducing forces. But in the case of this pitcher, it's going pretty hard. It's going 90. Because of his early trunk rotation, which you can see in front foot as he's tucking his glove side early, that causes the arm to drag and push. When the arm pushes forward, like it. So we're looking for this point. We're looking for this point right here. See how the, the arm, the elbow right here, it's just the elbow. See how it comes around? It's going to stop, move up, and then keep going. Watch this. That's here. It gets way in front of the face and forces interrotation early. 
which more than likely would have had to overcompensate with the arm energy. And as you can see, now the kinetic energy that came up the body starts to throw the elbow up and forward towards the target in this line. And he was able to have both those energies. So what you typically see is you don't see the break. You see the, it's just a loop. It's just a complete loop. With him, you saw it stop, release, and then go up in the air. So he had a disconnection between his kinetic energy coming up and his arm energy bringing the ball forward. He forced his arm energy to go ahead of his kinetic energy, and then he missed his kinetic energy pushing his elbow up at the end. And this guy had arm problems, and he wound up having Tommy John surgery. Okay, so that's the thing, is you got to learn that, and that's what we've been teaching you here, is it's this harmony of how you use your kinetic energy and you sync it up with your arm strength. And ultimately, when we can put them together, your arm can now become a regulator and not work so hard as a generator, which unfortunately is what leads to all of our injury. And that's really the top velocity methodology, just to get to this real quick. The top velocity methodology is teaching you how to do that. It's teaching you how to develop a better kinetic chain. It's teaching you how to develop more physical fitness to better perform those movements in the kinetic chain. And what we do is ultimately we believe if we can make you better athletes, we can more easily help you create the better kinetic chain or the better sequence of the movements. And then also ultimately, too, we've got to help you maintain that through your career, which is just as challenging as getting there. So what we typically do is we take you in, we do a full evaluation. We measure out what's called your anthropometrics. That's basically all your, your joint movements, right? Your, your joint length and everything. And then we measure out performance movements, how athletic you are, how you jump and run and sprint. And then your biomechanics. How are you using your body when you throw? We, we create leaderboards with that, which is cool. We actually rank people with that. So you can see where you are. Hey, am I doing well for my age? Or am I doing poor for my age? Am I sequencing my kinetic chain well, like my age group? Or am I not sequencing it well for my age group? We then also can take our own data and look at correlations. We can show you, hey, based on all the guys we've had through, we find those that are better performers and healthier performance. Um, you know, for example, with this case, have more front leg ground forces. We also use an Olympic style lifting approach. A lot of people question why we do that. The reason we do that is because it's superior as far as other lifts and developing a more explosive kinetic chain. It's also a highly skilled movement. I'm almost done here. A lot of people get concerned with when we use the Olympic lifts and weight training for the injury rates. I just wanted to show you the study here. There's a lot of misconceptions with lifting in general at a young age, specifically Olympic lifting. Out of all the recreational sports, least amount of injury. Um, the studies also show at a young age, it's as beneficial or more beneficial for youth to do lifting or some form of strength and conditioning than adults. Ideally, when you're young, you don't need a lot of weight. You just need to learn the techniques, be able to train the joint stability to get through those techniques. Those are all the key things that you're really gonna learn when you lift young. We use a medicine ball approach to training movement. We make a big distinction between a medicine ball, throwing a medicine ball through the kinetic chain, as opposed to throwing a heavy baseball through a kinetic chain. When you throw a heavy medicine ball through the kinetic chain, you can even throw it like you're pitching, but we do it with two hands. It uses the overload theory, which does force you to recruit more movements and use a better kinetic chain, but it does it, it forces your throwing arm to stay connected to your body because when the arm wants to separate and drag and push with the weight, that's where all the problems come from. That's why I believe there's more injury in those methodologies than a, than a medicine ball methodology. So some of our training programs go from, obviously we're known mostly for pitchers, but we go into position players and we're working into hitters. And you can follow us online. Thank you guys, I appreciate that. Y'all have any questions? Let me know. All right, stream, if you have any questions now is the time to ask. We got Brent with Top Velocity with us. There's about a minute delay, so it might be a second before these pop up guys. So if you have any questions in the meantime, yeah. What's what's Olympic style lifting? So Olympic style lifting, very good question. 
is going to be, there's, there are only two lifts, clean and jerk and the snatch. The reason I like these lifts is because it's a, it's a kinetic movement. It's that highly efficient kinetic movement. To move the bar up the body, you have to understand sequencing. It, you will not be successful in lifting weight with the Olympic lifts if you don't know how to sequence the kinetic chain. So what you're doing is, yeah, we do the other stuff like the jumps and the runs and the lunges, but when it comes to really building the elite power athlete, if you can train power while you're forcing them to better sequence the kinetic chain, you're gonna get a better mover, a more complex power athlete when you go into the skip. So that's why I, I use it by far. It's a superior way to do it because you're getting both. You're getting strength and power and you're getting a better sequence, better sequencing of the kinetic chain. So ASMI says, that's awesome good question so basically what they're saying is they don't want the game stress more than eight months so you've got to look at the game stress game stress is typically at the maximum torch your arm can handle it's typically where we go the problem is we even got to be careful when we're in those four months outside of that game stress with like long toss distances because studies show at 120 feet amateur athletes are already maximizing the stress on their arm at 120 feet so ideally those four months asmi is saying you can't be in anything that's pushing you to maximum stress so you can't be in that 120 foot throw you can't be in a showcase playing on the weekend um, you really need to be in just drill training. So I typically, what we do with the top velocity methods, it's just all drill training, mainly trying to teach how to move the energy up. So that way we know we're taking stress off the arm. So if we take an athlete in that threw all the eight months, and yeah, we're throwing them, but we're, we're all in these drills that drive your legs and hips and separate and then throw the ball. We know that the stresses are coming down, and we're also not in a game environment where the stresses are high because we're more than likely 45 to 60 feet, and our focus is just biomechanics. So for those four months, it's just all about biomechanics and low stress throws. Well, Chris, we have a question from Sam here from Stream. He's asking, can you explain portion and the connection between vertical jump and velocity? Okay, so torsion, they want to go advance. So <laughs> torsion is how we build stability in rotation, okay? So our joints do two things. They flex, extend, which is like a linear movement, and then they rotate, right? External, internal rotation. So we can build stability in both positions, but ideally we, we can stabilize more in rotation. Typically, like for example, in the femur, in the lower half, in external rotation. I, my joints, knee and hip, will stabilize better when my femurs are turned out, okay? That's important because we learn when you try to create force up the kinetic chain out of the ground, we're not gonna do that well if we're unstable. Coach Linsky was talking about that. My knees are in, there's no stability here. It's typically where we tear our UCL. So when I can turn them out and twist that femur out, I create a more stable hip joint and a more stable knee joint. And now I can create more force, which is getting that, preventing that loss of 20% that forced the 34%. Now we can push up more force, potentially putting the arm in a healthier place. The other one is vertical jump. I'm a big believer in ground force and in, its correlations to velocity. Studies do show it correlates to velocity. But you got to understand too, if I just fire off ground force and I don't sequence my kinetic chain properly, am I going to get a good result? Right? So a lot of people, unfortunately, think with pitching and probably with a lot of skills, is everyone thinks it just takes one thing. I just got to do one thing really well. And that's so untrue. Because the kinetic chain is so, there's so many links and connections, and we have to sequence in it correctly, there's more than one thing we have to do well. So a lot of people, when they hear me say, oh, vertical jumps are very important, they go out and try to get a better vertical jump, and the ball speed doesn't go up, and then they get frustrated. Well, it's because that was just a piece of the puzzle, right? That was just a little piece. It was an important piece, but it was just a little piece. We still don't have the whole picture. So we, ha yeah, we have to get the leg power, but at the same time too, like we taught you today, you have to learn how to sequence it, like with the whip, to get it up to the ball and to the arm. Good question. Right, quiet on the street. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.